Um, in this video, I will talk about uh, you know what is fundamental to information retrieval, uh, which is text similarity. Whether it's a, a question answer system or a very simple search engine where the user is expected to enter a query, that could be a query uh, constituting keywords or you know phrases or even natural language as an input. So how does uh, the system figure out the user's intent and uh, retrieve the corresponding documents? So at, at a very fun fundamentally speaking, there has to be some notion of relevance or similarity uh, between what the user is wanting versus what the document can give. Um, so uh, as such, machines can't understand text. So there has to be some representation of the words, sentences and documents only then uh, machine can begin to process uh, uh, the user's uh, uh, inputs. Uh, now, classically speaking, um, a document uh, is typically represented in terms of what is known as term frequency representation. So, in here you see, for example, uh, these are W1, W2, up to WV, uh, these are the unique words that exist in your corpus. In this case, corpus is nothing but the entire collection of the documents that you have in your repository and against which a, a query will be or need to be resolved. So this D1, D2, D3 are a bunch of documents. Now, um, uh, so this D1 could be a Wikipedia article uh, talking about such intentional curve. D2 could be a Wikipedia article talking about a page talking about uh, um, uh, President Mukherjee like that. So W1, W2 could be words like a dog, cat, all the unique words that you see in the language. Uh, when we say in the language, we, may, we are referring to all the words that exist in the corpus. It's not the entire language that we are talking about. So this particular matrix representation of the document is as follows, right? So if, for example, in document D1, uh, we have seen, there is, we did not see word W1, but we saw W2, word W2 twice, uh, uh, and there is some other word which, which occurred 10 times in that particular document. Um, so if D2 is basically a document, uh, the cat sat on the mat. That cat is not mine. Uh, I think this should be one. Uh, so this is document one. So uh, you see the if W2 is basically cat, the, the cat word appear twice. Therefore, uh, you see number two uh, in the in document D1. It's like likewise. Uh, this is called as a time frequency document. And uh, this is a very classical representation of uh, you know, documents uh, against the words. Now you can begin to see that. Now uh, this can be seen as... Uh, this can be seen as uh, as a word representation. Uh, uh, that is, um, and how this particular word was used in the document is given by the column vectors. Likewise, the row vectors talk about how this document is represented against the vocabulary that we have. Uh, so, in some sense, we can say that the column vectors are the word embeddings or the word representations. But uh, what you can notice is that this matrix is going to be very sparse uh, because you know, documents are typically let's say length of let's say 100 or 200 but definitely much much smaller than the total vocabulary that you have. Uh, the V could run into um, let's say thousands or hundreds of thousands but the document length we typically won't contain, exceed more than let's say thousand at worst. So in that sense now this matrix uh, now will look very sparse. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's the matrix that we used uh, uh, predominantly in you know, retrieval systems. What do, you, what do I mean by retrieval system is, uh, there is a query. Query is nothing but uh, a collection of words. Uh, generally speaking, it should be a collection, ordered collection of words. And then there is document which is also an order, ordered collection of words. How do you match uh, between what the user's query was uh, versus what the document actually contained? So, uh, the scoring, so in some sense, you need a scoring mechanism to rank the documents uh, with respect to the presence of the words in the query versus the element of surprise that you have. Uh, for example, this is called as a term frequency. Uh, it, it, it says how many times word WK occurred in document DI. So, if you are talking about D2 as our document, rather D1 as our document, we know if the WK is basically cat, we know that the term frequency of cat in document D1 is basically 2. The inverse document frequency talks about the surprise element or the perplexity. Uh, if, if, if our entire Wikipedia and our corpus is only talking about cat, then cat is not a very, very you know, useful term to uh, think about because it's all about cats. So therefore, I don't, 
I, I won't be interested in cat as such because that's uh, so uninformative, right? Uh, 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 and uh, other extreme examples are looking at the stop words. Uh, if you see something like the and uh, you know etc., these are called stop words because they don't they occur quite not quite, quite often. They're more they're they're there for more of a linguistic uh, reasons as opposed to of course they do give meaning. But as a user, I would be interested in looking for concepts as opposed to you know, articles and prepositions. Therefore, the the inverse document frequency gives more weight to less frequently occurring words and gives less weight to more frequently occurring words. Therefore, there is a, some kind of balance between uh, uh, how strongly the query is basically present in the document or the intent of the query uh, uh, represented by the words in the query is basically present in the document versus how perplexing uh, uh, that particular term I look, I'm looking for. Uh, well, this is a traditional, um, of course, there are a lot of variations. This is roughly speaking. The, the scoring mechanism for a given word to with respect to a document is the product of the term frequency uh, term frequency multiplied by its inverse document frequency. Uh, there are other, <coughs> of course, uh, they are they underwent extensive changes and evolutions. Uh, for example, OCAPI B25 uh, sounds like uh, an industry standard uh, where they optimized and tuned a lot of parameters because ultimately. You no know, search and retrieval systems you no know, uh, have to have a fair bit of amount of uh, you no know, user experience as well. Uh, you now, when I, when when user types, what would he typing? Uh, what kind of documents he would be interested in, or she would be interested in things like that. So, um, so well, uh, that's the traditional uh, information retrieval. Uh, let's move on to uh, what what are the issues with it? Let's just. Uh, so, as, as I uh, briefly mentioned, the problem with uh, you know, term frequency representations are that they are extremely sparse, uh, even though two sentences could be similar, uh, because the vector represent representations are very sparse, uh, they could almost be orthogonal, right? Um, uh, for example, if you look at these two words, Obama greets the press versus the president spoke with the reporters. Semantically, these two are equivalent. But if you look at the composition of the words, they're completely orthogonal. In this case, Obama means it's the president. Uh, no greets, it's uh, equivalent to speaking. Uh, press means that it's basically a bunch of reporters or someone related to the journalism industry. So semantically, these are quite close. But if you look at the actual word presence, uh, they're completely different. So if you go simply go by TF-IDF kind of representations, you see that the similarity or score between these two will be uh, fairly small. Uh, so, how do we overcome these problems? Uh, so, that's where, for example, word to vec comes uh, handy. Uh, in, in, in linguistic, it's understood that the meaning of the word is given by its context. So, I don't necessarily need to look for exact words. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, when I say cat, I could also mean I'm actually talking about pets. So, when I communicate, I communicate in specifics, saying cat, but when you retrieve me results in the form of a pet, I, I might be okay. Right. So, but how do you figure out this kind of a semantic relationships? Of course, you have the systems like a word to net uh, where uh, uh, they're cataloged, the synsets. Now you call them as synsets, right? Cat um, is, a, is a pet and our dog is a pet. In that sense, cat and dog are kind of related because both of them can be pets. So, uh, either you need to have a repository or knowledge uh, elsewhere or you have to build that kind of a knowledge uh, by understanding the corpus. So, the fundamental premise on which uh, these embeddings can be learned is uh, the context, the word is understood by its context. So, let's take a couple of examples. Uh, the cat sat on the mat, the rat sat on the mat, the dog sat on the floor, the moon sat on the floor. So, first three actually look qu quite similar because the cat is almost replaceable by rat, rat is replaceable by dog, mat is replaceable by floor. In that sense, we can say that cat, rat and dog are kind of a similar, mat and floor also kind of a similar, but by looking at the sentences, we can figure out that you now cat, rat, dog uh, are similar, but they are not, uh, not, not similar to moon because this doesn't make sense. Why do I say it doesn't make sense? Because I almost never see a sentence like this unless it is, unless it is fiction. The moon sat on the floor or moon happens to be someone's names like a Korean name. But otherwise, no, that's what we mean to say. Uh, so, just by looking at uh, 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 evidence in the form of a sentences that are present in the corpus, I can say that uh, if I need to learn the vector rep representations for cat, rat and dog, uh, they, they should be very similar. Uh, this is called as distributional hypothesis. 
so uh, words that are similar in meaning need to occur together in the vector space unlike the term frequency representations where uh, no similar meaning words could and occupy entirely different orthogonal spaces okay that's what basically uh, you know word to vec can allow you to do that but how do you learn those uh, vector embeddings so fundamentally this is the problem statement of course there are a lot of variations around it but this is one uh, called as cbow or continuous bag of words representation uh, to learn these word, word emptings. What it means is that, let's say this is the word of focus. No, this is WK plus 1 is the word I'm interested in. I want to predict this particular word based on the context given to me on the to the left of the word in focus versus uh, to the right of the uh, to the right context. So the left context is a set of K words, the right context is basically set of K words and I'm trying to predict what this intermediate or the center word is. So if I'm if I, in that sense, I want to learn my vector embedding such that I maximize the probability of the center word given the left context and the right context. Essentially, I can treat this as a classification problem. For simplicity, for simplicity, let's say that I simply want to predict the next word given the current word. So I'm, I'm trying to say that I just have a single word in my left window. My center window is basically what I want to predict. Uh, and we could use the one hot coding, which means that if the size of the vocabulary is, let's say, V, then every word is basically uh, represented by uh, mm, by uh, just uh, uh, if if a cat basically be, uh, is a, uh, is what I want to represent, then I just place one in the corresponding dimension. If I need to represent every every other dimension, will basically get a zero. That's why it's called as one heart encoding. So that's the vector. That's input vector that you give. That's your uh, you know, left uh, or the next previous uh, word or the current word. And on that right hand side, you want to predict the next word. So again, if sat is basically the word I want to predict, I mark it a word. So it's like your, it's like a one of, one of K classifications. If I have V words, I'm simply trying to predict the label that the word sat belongs to. And everywhere else, it is basically zero. Uh, uh, so in that sense, I have, if I were to build a feed forward neural network, my input layer has a, a V dimensional input my output layer has a v-dimensional output layer with a softmax because I treat this as a classification problem. My single hidden layer contains d dimensions. So this d is basically the um, latent dimensions in which uh, against which I want to uh, have my representations. So, uh, so the sparse v-dimensional representation of a word is mapped to a, a dense low dimensional embedding which is d in this case. Uh, typically the d would be on the order of 100 or 200 uh, depending on the size of the corpus and the vocabulary that you uh, are dealing with. So that gives us uh, word to vector representations. What's interesting in word to vector representations is that they encode the relationships too. And then for example, in this case, you see that if I just take D equals to 2, that means I can represent any word in a set of two dimensions, uh, like an X and X axis and a Y axis. So, for example, man is represented by two coordinates, king is represented by two coordinates. If I plot all the four words um, in, in, the, in the XY plane, in the Cartesian coordinates, I see that, for example, king and man are close, queen and women are close. And what you also notice is that uh, the vector directions. So in that sense, if I take a vector difference between king and queen, and if I add, add that to the man, I would get a representation for woman. It, it will be very similar to a woman. That means uh, not only does it embed words that are uh, similar in meaning uh, in, a, in a closer space, but it also encodes uh, the differences, um, rather relationships in terms of uh, the uh, differences between those word embeddings in terms of the vectors. So that's a very powerful uh, concept. Uh, uh, concept okay so nevertheless what we uh, come uh, come to conclusion is that now we could have we could learn word embeddings either through term frequency representation or a latent semantic analysis or you no know, word vectors so uh, bottom line we represent text as a set of uh, you no know, vectors a word as a vectors so that's the bottom line uh, which one does well depends on your method and application generally we tend to go with word to vex in the in the recent times all right. Now we come back to our fundamental problem. So in the beginning, we said that in the information retrieval, uh, we need to have a, we need to figure a, figure out a way of uh, matching a user's query uh, to a set of documents. In, in other words, I want to find a scoring mechanism um, uh, that can uh, talk about similarity between uh, two documents. When I say, generally speaking, I say document because query is also a document uh, or a question is also a document. So I abstractly speaking, I say 
I want to find a method that will give me a similarity between two documents. Now similarity is very much related to distance. Uh, uh, in some sense you can say that distance is uh, a negation of uh, similarity um, you know, with a negative polarity. All right. So what has been done recently uh, is that uh, all right. Uh, so we know that you now documents could be of varying length and the word composition can be different. Now for example, let me take uh, 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 this as uh, let's say there is a document P, there is a document Q. Uh, w1, W2, W3 and W4 are the set of words that I have in document P. This shows the frequency with which they occur. For example, in document P, uh, W1 occurs 90% of the time. That means it gets repeated quite often. And W2 occurs 10% of the times. And W3 and W4 never occur. On the other hand, in document Q, I see the same word W1 that occurs 20% of the times. And the rest of the words W4, W5 and W6 are unique to document Q. And they occur with 20%, 20%, 40% respectively. Now, my problem statement is that given a document and the term frequency, normalized term frequency in both of these documents, how do I compute the similarity between these two? Now, obviously, term frequency, inverse document frequency can also be used to figure out uh, distance between these two or similarity between these two uh, with which you can compare or rank documents. Right? Typically, I say Q is for query, P is for any candidate document. So if you have a corpus of, let's say, 10,000 documents, this P runs from 1 to 10,000. Q is basically your query. It could be just a set of keywords, concepts, or uh, you know, it could be expressed in national language too. All right. So, um, so uh, given that I have, let's say, word embeddings, let's say W1 is a word, I have its d-dimensional embedding, W2 is a vector, W3 is a vector, and I have words on the right-hand side too. So I, I can somehow define the cost between uh, W1 and W1, W1 and W4. Well, let me roll back and say, my problem is to make the distribution of the words on the left hand side to look like distribution of words on the right hand side. That means uh, I want to, uh, there is a, the, the total mass on the left hand side is basically 1, the total mass on the left hand side is also 1. So for, for example, I want to take let's say 0.1 of 0.2 of the mass that exists on W1 and push it to W1. Then there is a 0.7 mass left on the 1, I need to distribute that to um, let's say I take 0 0.4, 0 0.4 mass from W1 and distribute it to W6. I take 0 0.2 mass from W1 and distribute it to W4, W5 and take 0 0.1 from W1 and give it back to uh, uh, W4 and take 0 0.0 from W2 and give it back to a uh, word W4. In some sense, I am trying to equalize. If you imagine there is a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, distribution here. Let me draw a hypothetical curve. So basically this is the histogram, right? It's, it's, it's looking like this. That's a histogram on the left hand side. The histogram on, the on this side is basically looking like, like this, right? So I, I somehow want to make the curve on the left hand side look like the curve on the right hand side. But uh, uh, the costs are not going to be equal. Because if W1 and w, W1 are, uh, are the same words, then I don't have any cost because the exact same word, if, if the word occurs with the exact same frequency, then uh, with respect to word, uh, that particular word, these two documents are very similar. But notice in this, in this particular example, now Q, Q has uh, now three additional words, W4, W5 and W6. So in some sense, uh, now both W1 and W2 are different but nevertheless they are semantically you know, very similar, then the cost is going to go down. Versus if W4, W5 and W6 are you know, different semantically, then W1 will be different with the rest of the stuff. In some sense, we want to consider the, semant the, the semantic similarity between words and at the same time, we also want to look at the composition of those words given to us. Okay? So this we pose it as a min cost pro min minimum cost flow problem. That means, we assume that this is like a source side, on the left hand side is like a source side. Uh, so if this is like a source side, uh, this is the sink side. So we want to supply goods from the left hand side to the right, uh, right hand side, but obviously these are like a shipping lanes. If you want to move from W1 to W1, there is no cost involved. If you want to move some units of goods from W1 to W4, you incur the cost. That is defined by CIJ. Now, CIJ is a transportation cost 
to move a unit uh, goods uh, unit of goods from the left hand side to the right hand side and what is our eventual problem we want to maintain the total mass on the left hand side uh, same as the total mass on the right hand side which in this case it's basically one okay um, so that's the problem statement for us in fact this is exactly called as f movers distance and this is a predominantly used in image processing in content based image retrievals uh, the f movers distance uh, uh, is supposed to uh, re uh, fetch or retrieve images that maintain perpetual perceptual quality that means you know, qualitatively or subjectively uh, they look similar to the user okay so how do we define cij just uh, as we mentioned before uh, we have word emptings for w and wj so i can define the distance between word i on the left hand side basically my document p and j is a word j in my document q and w and wj are basically two word embeddings i can simply take a euclidean distance between these two that becomes the uh, cost to move uh, let's say a word from the left hand side to the right hand side uh, eventually my problem statement is as follows uh, so this, this tij is is called the flow in uh, in uh, network flow uh, literature or that will network flow uh, parlance uh, cij is the cost associated with that my objective is to ship goods from the source to the sink uh, with with uh, as minimum cost as possible so this tij is basically the flow uh, my constraints on the flow are that uh, the outward flow from a particular node needs to be pi that means uh, if uh, let's say a word occurs with let's say 90 percent probability then all the outward um, no unit goods should uh, the mass the the outward mass from node i should should be equal to 0 0.9 likewise the on the incident side you now every sync node has to match exactly um, the uh, the demand or the uh, inflow should be equal to the probability or the mass of the jth node. Um, uh, so that's a constraint and these network flows have to be a uh, non-negative. They can be zero but they have to be non-negative. So given these two constraints, um, now uh, we can interpret the minimum cost obtained as a distance between um, be between uh, uh, let's say two histograms or uh, you know, two documents uh, uh, where you know, we have access to uh, the word embeddings uh, using which we compute distance between words. Well, this apparently is called as uh, the word mover distance. Uh, I think it is proposed around in 2015. Uh, apparently, this beats all, all the classical IR systems on the data set that I have considered, uh, like uh, TF, TFIDF, uh, you know, some even uh, exotic stuff, and uh, 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 OPAC uh, B25. Um, so, it seems like you know, it's like the state of the art because not only it, it considers the semantic relationship not just the term frequencies at the same time it will look at uh, you know um, the composition present in the documents i think what my suspicion is that it doesn't consider the inverse document frequencies so it's possible to extend that idea so that not only you discover documents based on the you know, semantic similarity at the same time you could have a perplexed element a cat at two i think that's an extension is possible um, but one noticeable again uh, no difference though is that uh, the word M, even though the word M things do consider uh, the positionality of the word in words uh, uh, whether it's a skip gram or CBO models it is it is limited to the context um, but nevertheless when you are treating uh, a similarity between two documents we simply treat that as a treat that as a bag of words model because this W1, W2 are now exchangeable it's like a bag of words where we lose the information about the position. We don't know whether W1 precedes W2 or W2 precedes W4. We simply don't know. So this particular cost model doesn't consider that kind of positionality. In other words, the syntax uh, is basically lost. The structure on the document is basically lost. So that's a possible extension we will think about, in which case we call that as a you know, sequence to sequence distance that considers both the semantics as well as the syntax. Okay. So just to recall that the word mover distance is an application of the F mover distance as we just discussed before. Uh, the cost of moving a word from the document P to document Q is based on the word to vec and uh, the frequency distribution of the words in uh, both the respective documents. That's what uh, word, to, word mover distance is based upon. But as I said, it doesn't consider uh, the syntactical structure or the structure of the document. So if I if I parse uh, a document or a sentence using the syntax tree, uh, if I take uh, an example as the cat sat on the mat, this is the syntax tree for the word uh, for the document or a sentence uh, P. Uh, 
and he saw the cat uh, that's a sentence q and you can clearly see that the cat is basically the object in in sentence uh, he saw the cat and the cat became the subject um, uh, in the left uh, uh, document p therefore cat is basically playing a different role uh, syntactically speaking uh, from a figure of speech so and then how do we account for the fact that you know, even though cat is basically kind of a similar but it's not used in the similar um, you know, structural context so how do we uh, do that well um, we just understand that now uh, we somehow uh, just as we did in uh, word mover distance we need a way of computing the cost of a given word from the uh, from left hand side to the right hand side if you see this as a source and if you see this as a sink we need to define a cost function that will account the path information too. Uh, now I could traverse the syntax tree all the way up to the root then I have a bridge between the two roots of the tree so if I need to move a word from word cat on the left hand side from the sink side to cat on the right hand side what I could do is I go from cat and uh, uh, I traverse the to the root then from the root to the next root and descend upon because uh, this is a tree there is always a unique path from a uh, terminal leaf to the root and given a terminal leaf I can always go back to the cat there exists only one path because it doesn't contain cycles and it is a uh, uh, undirected graph so uh, from the source I treat this as a uh, no left to right and on the sink side I consider this as a right to left uh, navigation so but then how do we define distance between cat as a terminal leaf to its parent parental knob its parent the parent is nothing but the set of words the cat okay in that sense it becomes like a phrase and eventually the root is nothing but the whole sentence so I have so just the way we can uh, we can embed words we can also embed paragraphs paragraph is nothing but a a, a, a an ordered collection of sentences uh, no in that sense I can uh, the simplest paragraph is nothing but a sentence therefore if I have a sentence I can have uh, a, a, a embed a sentence also into um, uh, embed a sentence also into vector form therefore I can just the way I have word embeddings at the terminal leaves I could also have word embeddings at the um, uh, parental nodes and uh, simply a root is nothing but a document itself uh, in this case it's a sequence or a sentence therefore uh, I have a way of uh, uh, having uh, vector representations for all the nodes in the tree both uh, terminal as well as non-terminal nodes so I recursively uh, compute uh, if I want to know that if I want to have a dis know the distance between cat to uh, any other word in the left hand side of the tree uh, I could I simply uh, traverse through the path there is a unique path that exists between, uh, between every word to every other word so uh, I, uh, the path is nothing but the hops the distance the total distance travel uh, traversed from uh, one terminal to other, any other terminal on the sink side of it so I, this is how I define so if I need to define uh, so if I need to define uh, for example the distance between cat in the uh, document P and cat uh, in the document Q so first I go from cat to the phrase the cat and traverse upwards to the root finally I get from the word cat to the root which is basically P then given P I go to the next root Q from Q I descend down to the terminal node uh, cat uh, what I'm saying is that so first you compute the distance from cat to p1 uh, which is basically a phrase from phrase to the sentence then go from this document to this document uh, which is again you, if you have access to the paragraph embeddings you can compute distance between these two so in other words that there, there you can define the edge between you can define a distance between uh, every uh, the child to the parent so in that sense you can uh, you there is a there is a uh, the edge uh, weight is given by the distance between uh, the parent to its children that is computable so if I if I simply want to have uh, if I was simply want to compute distance between this cat and that cat I simply add up all the distances that I pick up along the unique path that exists between the cat to the cat on the on to the right side likewise you can repeat this process eventually you can come up with uh, uh, every pairwise distance so you have a set of notes on the left hand side the sink side and you have a set of notes or terminal notes on the right hand side you can compute the distance from every pair between left to the right that gives you the total distance matrix and uh, 
that that gives you cij and it is just now uh, uh, simply application of uh, the earth mover distance so the tij is basically the same you still have uh, the tij is basically the flow which is what you want to minimize a uh, cij is the cost between every pair of words from the left to the right in this case the cost includes both the syntactical uh, navigation that is required so so the positionality is considered as well as the semantics are also considered this becomes our distance metric so with that uh, given a sync given a sequence uh, uh, given a set of two, given two sequences uh, or given two documents i could compute uh, the distance between these two that i can use to rank a set of documents against a query that i have um well this happens to be uh, operating at the you know um, and the sentence level uh, right because the syntax tree is for a given sentence but how do you extend this model to deal with uh, multiple sequences which is nothing but a document a document would typically contain multiple sequences so uh, once you have a, a way of computing um, a, a distance between a pair of sequences you can simply say that there is a bunch of sequence on the left hand side there is a bunch of sequence on the left right hand side you can say the distance between these two is the maximum of the pairwise distance between the between the left and the right sentences this is actually called as a single single linkage distance uh, which is typically used in hierarchical agglomerate agglomerative clustering uh, you can uh, just the way you can define the maximum uh, the distance as the maximum distance observed between the left and the right pairs you can also consider the average distance or the minimum distance now different these are all called average linkage minimum linkage or single linkage uh, or max linkage uh, they they come up with different technologies so that allows us to come up with a, a a a scoring function for information retrieval uh that considered both the semantics as well as the syntactical structure of the query and the documents that one has so uh that's basically the extension we can think of for uh the word to mover word to mover basically consider the semantic similarities not just uh, uh you know uh more term frequencies and inverse document frequencies that's about it um and uh, uh, this uh, earth mover distance uh, should exist in many you know c languages and there is a python wrapper available so once you know how to compute cij is it's a basically an optimiz it's a linear optimization problem uh, that one needs to solve and there are some good approximations to this distance metric too if this becomes computationally prohibitive okay so that's the uh, you know discussion rather uh, you know commentary on uh, how can we embed uh, or rather incorporate both syntactical structures and semantics uh while uh, uh computing text similarity all right thank thanks for watching.